Is Brazil's president really reaching for the Trump playbook? On Independence Day, Jair Bolsonaro in the capital to lead a rally against Congress and the Supreme Court. In the capital, no January 6th moment earlier, as critics had feared, but institutions are being tested, same as during the storming of the U.S. Capitol by Trump supporters. Bolsonaro claims the system's rigged, he's called to change the voting system, and there have been cries of witch hunt as corruption probes against the current administration gain steam. Trump may be out of office, but he's still the model for Brazil's far-right leader. And after Brasilia, it was on to Sao Paulo for Bolsonaro due in the afternoon for another march. Sao Paulo, the stronghold of another populist, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, the leftist former president who's now out of jail and ahead in the polls. Lula's supporters were told to steer clear of Bolsonaro rallies, not to offer an excuse to suspend rule of law, as they put it. Could Brazil's far-right leader, himself a former army captain, really try some form of power grab? Or is that overstated? More broadly, how's the world's third largest democracy holding up in these times of COVID and populism? Today in the France 24 debate, uh, we're looking at Bolsonaro upping the pressure. Joining us uh, from Sao Paulo, Wall Street Journal correspondent Samantha Pearson. Thank you for being with us. Thanks very much. Academic uh, Marcia Camargos is a member of the activist group Alerte France Brésil. That's it. <laughs> Happy Independence Day. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And from Lisbon, attorney uh, Fernando Santiago, Happy Independence Day to you as well. Thank you very much, Francois. Happy to be here. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Yeah, they were bust in by the thousands, they say. Jair Bolsonaro's supporters hoping uh, for the largest turnout since the mass protest that called for the impeachment of uh, then-President Dilma Rousseff. Solange Mouchin has more on what was at stake when the day began. He's revved up the crowds before. Jair Bolsonaro has never shied away from rallying his most ardent fans, like here in Rio last May. Openly nostalgic of Brazil's military dictatorship, President Bolsonaro has also of late reminded the country of his ties to the military, hosting an unprecedented procession of tanks on August 10th. A flexing of military might, a show of his avid fan base, Bolsonaro has launched an offensive. For polls show that 60% of voters would, under no circumstances, vote for him again in next year's elections. And his presidency has been hit hard by a raft of judicial investigations, including Supreme Court probes, ones that the far-right leader shot back against last week, calling for his supporters to rally and to issue what he calls an ultimatum to the Supreme Court. After September the 7th, those one or two who dare to defy us, defy the Constitution, disrespect the Brazilian people, they will know how to return to their place. Bolsonaro's critics say they're fearful that the president is encouraging an attack on the courts in the vein of Trump fans charging the U.S. Capitol. In an open letter, some 150 left-leaning international political figures said that they were gravely concerned about the imminent threat to Brazil's democratic institutions. A likely challenger in next year's elections, former President Lula da Silva also commented on social media, saying Bolsonaro was sowing hatred, division and violence rather than providing solutions. So, uh, Samantha Pearson, uh, Brasilia seems to have gone off peacefully. How are things where you are? So, yeah, I'm here in Sao Paulo. Our office is actually on Avenida Paulista, which is the main avenue in Sao Paulo, which is normally where all the protests um, are held. Um, at the moment, it's very much a party atmosphere here as well. Um, there's a lot of... Um, uh, people in Brazilian uh, T-shirts and Brazilian colors with flags. There's horns blaring, people selling souvenirs, people drinking beer. Now, this is this is normally how Brazilian protests start. I've been here in Brazil now for 10 years. Um, I saw the massive protests in 2013. And it, that's how they normally start off. They start off in a very kind of Brazilian party-like way. Um, so what we're really watching is what happens later, what happens when it gets dark, what happens when people get really drunk, what happens with the police. Um, so at the moment, things, things, are, things are okay. The, the mood seems okay at the moment. Um, the police have got things under control here, but um, there's still a really a big question mark about what happens later today.
And just to be clear, it is uh, exclusively pro Bolsonaro supporters who are out in the street in front of you there? Exactly, yeah. I mean, on Avenida Paulista, um, I only saw people supporting um, Bolsonaro. I mean, there has been a, a great deal of fear. I think even um, I'm married to a Brazilian. A lot of his family actually voted for Bolsonaro in 2018. Um, and they all told me, you know, don't go out today. Don't go out into the city today. Um, and a lot of people are actually quite scared about what will happen today. So they've been staying at home. So I imagine um, the same goes for a lot of the opposition groups. I mean, they may come out later and that's when we may see clashes and things get more violent. Earlier in the day in Brasilia, the president addressing those fears. Let's listen to Jair Bolsonaro. We don't want disruption. We don't want to fight with any branch. But we can't accept efforts to distort our democracy. We can't accept anybody who puts our freedom at risk. We can't accept anybody who puts our freedom at risk. Uh, Marcia Camargos, how, how do Brazilians interpret it when they hear the president say that? Is this just, you know, a bit of political grandstanding? Well, uh, what happens is that he's just like a cornered animal showing his claws because it's now in the hands of uh, Justice Barroso, it's the minister of the current minister of the Supreme Court, Supreme Court, uh, to uh, make him uh, cancel his whole uh, ticket, and he won't be able to present himself in the next elections. And as well, uh, it's worse than that for him, of course. He will have to step off office, step out of office. Yeah, because what, he's desperate. People watching from the outside are thinking, well, the election's 13 months away, but you're saying that, in effect, uh, he can't go to those elections if the Supreme Court rules against him. He can't go, he can't go. And uh, I, I have to state that all we see now is the consequence of the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff in uh, 2016, which was actually a coup d'etat followed by the prison of Lula so that he would get out of the way of Bolsonaro in, that he could be ele elected. Hang on, so you, that you call it a coup d'etat, but yes, she it was is. impeached by Congress. There was a vote I know from that, lawmakers. but it was all manipulated. And afterwards, you see, uh, Lula was arrested and it shows that everything was ju just uh, um, a complot, something uh, made up. A plot. A plot in order to get him out of the uh, elections and uh, to elect Bolsonaro. And when you, you open uh, Pandora's box, you can never tell what will come out of it. And that's what's happening in Brazil. So this, the, excuse me, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. The language of calling it a plot, what happened to Dilma Rousseff. It is. Isn't that mirror the language that now Jair Bolsonaro is using against... Uh, uh, Not at are... all, because um, just after the coup d'etat, the plot, uh, Lula was arrested as well. It, it was an illegal uh, prison, and uh, he was a political prisoner. And afterwards, I mean, everything... Uh, went out of control, that nowadays not even the upper class and huge sectors of the middle class, middle class they are not supporting Bolsonaro any longer. For Fernando Santiago, uh, as an attorney, when you hear the accusations flying from one side to the other, your thoughts on uh, uh, after the huge strain Brazil's democracy came under with the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff, with the imprisonment of Lula, uh, how much strain is it under this time? Well, there's a lot of strain uh, going on. As you can see, a lot of tensions. Brazil is becoming a very polarized country with uh, um, lots of pressure from the left and from the right side. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro got into power uh, thanks to a, a huge uh, dissatisfaction from the public with uh, 20 years of uh, the left uh, and the huge scandals of uh, corruption going on every day, every day, every day, which uh, ended up with, of course, the prison of Lula and uh, with the impeachment of uh, Dilma Rousseff, which, as you, as, you, uh, as you said, it was declared by the Congress, not by the actual president, by, not by the president Bolsonaro. And uh, we have to say that both sides, they have their side of the story, and it's normal that it's like that. 
But what we can see is that Jair Bolsonaro, despite anything, uh, still benefits a lot of support, as we can see on the street right on this moment precisely. How much of that is genuine support? Well, it's hard to say. We can never say. But uh, it seems to me that even if you have some part of it that we could admit that even eventually is not genuine, I don't know. I think we can't... Uh, we could not mobilize that huge amount of people on the streets uh, without some willing and, and from when, the people. And when Bolsonaro says we can't accept anybody who puts our freedom at risk, he's clearly targeting those Supreme Court uh, uh, judges. Is he undermining democracy? Well, uh, I don't know if he's clearly uh, referring to the judge. He's he is referring to the judges, of course, but not clearly. <laughs> He's doing that a little softer than that way. Uh, well, there's a lot of political stuff going on. And uh, there's a huge difference between words and actions as well. So we need to see the end of the day. There's still a lot, a whole bunch to come. There will, we will uh, see Bolsonaro's speech in Sao Paulo later on. There we think we have even more elements to <laughs> judge about his uh, conduct or misconduct. So it's not just one case, Samantha Pearson, it's uh, several. There's cases of spreading disinformation among his supporters, um, financing issues, inciting violence, and among the scandals dogging Bolsonaro, a COVID vaccine procurement scandal that you wrote about in the Wall Street Journal, accusations of favoritism in purchasing doses of the Indian-made Covaxin vaccine. Is that the most important uh, of these cases that could have potentially come up against him? I think it's it's one of the most important, yes, because if you remember when Bolsonaro was elected in 2018, he very much chose this platform of anti-corruption. You know, I'm Bolsonaro, I'm different from everyone else in Brasilia. I'm a different type of politician. Um, and so just the glimpse that perhaps, and, and there is no solid evidence yet, it's, it's important to say that, but just the glimpse that perhaps he was connected to somebody who was involved in something corrupt, I mean, that just destroys his image with the people, his core voters, you know, those people that really want him to come back next year. Um, and I just wanted to add to the point that we were just talking about. Um, I mean, it's obviously important to see what's happening on the streets right now, but I would say actually what's more important is to understand the people that are at home today because those are the people that are going to change the results of next year's elections. The people that we see out on the streets, they're the people that are going to vote for him no matter what, you know, but what we really want to know as journalists, analysts, we want to know what are those people at home, who are they going to vote for? Because I think a lot of people still really hate Lula, they hate the PT, they believe that Lula is corrupt. I know we were just talking about the... Um, the conviction against Lula, obviously, that was thrown out because of the procedure um, uh, was terrible. The, the, the judge was found to be biased. Um, however, the evidence still exists. A lot of people still believe that Lula is corrupt. So now they're stuck between choosing between Bolsonaro next year and Lula. Um, and a lot of people actually don't like either of them. Um, but and this is this is the really important point. But if they had to choose, would they go back with Lula or would they go with Bolsonaro? And, and, and excuse me for making the parallel with the with the U.S.'s yep. 2020 election campaign. But now when you describe it that way, is it about firing up the base, whether it's Lula or Bolsonaro, the one who can get those unconditional supporters in greater numbers out? I kind of think, I mean, it's today is really about showing, uh, Bolsonaro wants those pictures. He wants that picture of Avenida Paulista completely full of his supporters. He wants this to prove next year when he runs for election and perhaps he loses. And then he's going to say, well, you know, there was election, there was fraud in, in the vote and that's why I lost. And the, he wants these photos from today to show that, to show that his, his support is much bigger than the polls suggest. But what I think is actually important is to understand those people that aren't here today, because I think a lot of people, I, I suspect a lot of people would still vote for him, people that are at home today. But I think he actually does have quite significant support. Um, and in 2018, a lot of people were embarrassed to say they would vote for Bolsonaro because everyone already knew that he was a supporter of, um, he, he, he um, fought under the dictatorship, um, um, Brazil's past military dictatorship. And a lot of people were embarrassed to say they, they were going to vote for him. And I think after COVID, the, the pandemic, so many people died in Brazil. 
um, he was blamed for that. And I think that's even more true today. A lot of Brazilians don't want to publicly say they would vote for Bolsonaro. But ha having spoken to them um, in private, and if you really push them and say, but if it was between Lula and Bolsonaro, mm, well, OK, yeah, I would vote for Bolsonaro. So I think that's actually what we should be looking at to, to, to work out what's going to happen next. Marcia Camargo? Uh, not at all, because they say about uh, the corruption in, in Lula's era, but then in his government. But we forget, we can't forget that uh, Bolsonaro is linked to the militia, to the organized crime, and it is a sort of Brazilian mafia. And uh, even if he has just a minority of supporters, they are very violent, very aggressive, and he wants to uh, instigate an uprising to uh, spread the spread fear, spread violence and chaos. So for Fernando Santiago, that's an important point. So we've had corruption cases on both sides. We agree on that. But what we have with Bolsonaro perhaps is a militarization of politics, himself a former army captain, many uh, military people uh, who are in government. Uh, do you agree with what you just heard that there is this potential for some kind of uh, uh, assault on rule of law? Well, first of all, uh, we don't agree on corruption on both sides. We, ha we do have some scandals which are really proved and really solid on Lula's and, and the leftist party side. But uh, we have some, uh, well, some maybe indicios of uh, uh, corruption in Bolsonaro related specifically on the COVAX uh, scandal, but which are not proved yet so far. Well, uh, we can say that, that indeed there is corruption on both sides. And what you said about uh, militarization, yes, Bolsonaro capitalized over all, uh, uh, well, politics in Brazil. They left the military from, from sideways uh, since the, the Brazil was a dictatorship and they did it was a natural reflex. But the thing is, uh, we forgot that between the military, there's a lot of very qualified people, very qualified, in intelligent people that are willing to go back and to do some uh, useful work for the country. So Bolsonaro, he does indeed uh, have the, 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 well, the basis of this military, but I'm not so sure and I won't say that uh, he's going to use the military for any personal reasons. I don't think Brazil will do so. Brazilian institutions are very strong. They won't accept something like that. Brazilian institutions very strong. We're going to pick up on that point when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. Uh, presidential elections in Brazil are still 13 months away, but already there are accusations that uh, the country's president, Jair Bolsonaro, is reaching for the Trump playbook, talking about a witch hunt with uh, criminal probes opened into uh, corruption and asking for a change in the electoral system. We're talking about it with uh, Samantha Pearson, Wall Street Journal correspondent in Sao Paulo. And on this Independence Day, um, your offices uh, uh, are, are just above uh, where they are marching in favor of Bolsonaro. Marcia Camargos, member of the activist group Alerte France Brésil and uh, academic historian. Uh, Fernando Santiago, attorney, is with us uh, from Lisbon. Welcome back uh, to all of you. Uh, just before the break, you heard Fernando say that uh, Brazil's institutions are strong. Not at all. They've never been as strong as other democracies. And it, they have been very hardly shaken with the, the coup d'etat against Dilma. And after that, as I say, we are seeing the consequence of all this. And uh, when he says that uh, Bolsonaro is not corrupt, I've got all the scandals of his uh, children that uh, buy things by cash, and there are lots of there are the congressional in, in, inquiry as well uh, for the pandemic, COVID pandemic. And he should have bought the vaccines. He was uh, he was uh, contacted by Pfizer in August uh, 2020, and he couldn't be bothered even to answer. So he, he just did that. He started the negotiations in the beginning of March when it was the peak of the Brazilian pandemic. And now, 
you know the result. We have more than half a million, half a million deaths. Uh, so, Samantha Pearson, is it really a fascination with the Trump way of governing uh, the, when it came calling COVID just a flu at the time? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are very strong parallels there with the U.S. Um, he found that that was, at the beginning at least of the pandemic, he really latched on to that discourse um, as a way to connect with his base in the same way that we saw in the U.S. I feel like things changed, um, you know, going into the um, this year. Um, so many Brazilians have died of COVID. I mean, the death toll has been horrific here. Um, and I feel like a lot of Bolsonaro supporters... You know, they started losing their family members. They saw up close what this disease can do. Um, they started getting vaccinated too. So Bolsonaro has backtracked a little bit um, and he is now blaming the Supreme Court because at the beginning of the pandemic, the Supreme Court gave state governments in Brazil power basically to do what they want in terms of pandemic response. So each of them kind of acted individually. Now, that, was, that really came because the federal government wasn't doing anything, you know, and these state governments were in panic because this disease was coming and there was nothing they could do. But now he's kind of backtracking and saying, no, the Supreme Court like didn't let me um, govern. Um, Bolsonaro likes to create these imaginary enemies, as he did before he got elected. Obviously, it's harder to find enemies when you are the head of state of a powerful country like Brazil. But I feel like today is an attempt to do that again, is an attempt to kind of carve out these imaginary enemies and play himself almost as a victim, you know, the real Brazilian who's fighting against a corrupt system. And the Supreme Court, you know, is then at the moment is enemy number one in that. The Supreme Court enemy number one uh, at the start of last month, and we were talking about the parallels with Donald Trump, uh, one of the Brazilian president's sons, Eduardo Bolsonaro, paid a, tr a call to Trump Tower in New York. This in preparation for uh, Brazil, uh, a Congress by... Uh, uh, conservative uh, lobbyists. The uh, CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Committee, has a Brazilian branch. It's modeled on uh, the CPAC in the U.S. And this past weekend, Donald Trump Jr. addressed CPAC Brazil by video link after stating that uh, he couldn't make it uh, because of flights from New Jersey were canceled because of the remnants of Hurricane Ida. Uh, your thoughts, Fernando Santiago, when you see uh, Bolsonaro uh, attach himself to the Trump brand? Well, uh, we cannot deny, I think nobody can deny the fact that Bolsonaro seems to be a huge fan of Trump's style of doing politics. And, uh, well, in that way, one can understand, but I think it's not the most, that's my personal view, it's not the most abile way of doing politics. I mean, Trump is not a, is a very controversial person, and Bolsonaro as well. I think he would have a lot to gain, uh, getting a little bit more moderate than this radical style, which is his style. He was elected based on that style. So uh, who am I to say <laughs> yeah, he better change? But it's it's really true. He likes it. It seems to be their model of doing things. And in, you talked earlier about the resilience of Brazil's institutions in the U.S., uh, it uh, really was uh, a real test of what happened on January the 6th with those riots at, at the Capitol. Do you fear that something like that could happen in Brazil? Well, I, I don't... Uh, well, Brazil is a very complicated country. I mean, whenever you try to predict something in Brazil, there's a famous saying that says that uh, uh, it's uh, one of uh, old politicians say that in Brazil, even the past... Uh, is doubtful. So, uh, yes, I do fear, but still, again, I, I believe in Brazilian institutions. They are indeed very solid. We've been through uh, many challenges since Brazil got out of the, uh, the dictatorship. So we must not forget that Brazil is a very young democracy. And uh, it was tested and tested again, uh, two impeachments already, uh, and, uh, and the institution stays strong. But politics is politics. Marcia Camargos? No, the, the politics, they didn't stay strong because the, uh, the institutions were really shaken with this uh, coup d'etat against Dilma. You call it a coup d'etat still? Uh, it, it was, uh, clearly. It's impeachment vote. Well, uh, it, it wasn't. I mean, uh, they've manipulated everybody in order to And then there was uh, a presidential Dilma. election. That was a fair vote, wasn't it? Where a fair vote for... Bolsonaro got elected, right? He got elected, 
uh, thanks to the fake news spread by WhatsApp, by uh, Facebook, which didn't cancel uh, their accounts. They could have done that. They should have done because it was a uh, criminal. But they didn't. And there's and a little bit that, of it that was people fed up with the Petrobras scandal with Lava Jato. Uh, they, they were never really proved to start with. And oh. nowadays, Bolsonaro is uh, the consequence of uh, all these uh, things that started even with the election of the parliament in uh, 2014, a very conservative parliament that was elected. And this parliament allowed to have the... to. to, to they could start against Dilma and the imprisonment of Lula. He was arrested illegally by a Judge Sergio Moro in order to uh, leave the way free for Bolsonaro. That's corruption in a very huge level. Samantha Pearson, your thoughts on the strength of Brazil's institutions? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not optimistic, um, to be honest. I mean, uh, Brazilians... I've always had relatively little trust in their institutions. And I feel like since Bolsonaro took office, um, he's actively tried to attack um, the few things that actually Brazilians do have some trust in. So one of them being the media, the mainstream media. Brazilians prior to Bolsonaro did actually trust relatively what the media said. Now a lot of his supporters hate the media. I mean, down on the streets today, there's a lot of signs against Brazilian media organizations and even international organizations. Um, and also Brazilians, I feel, in general, didn't have many doubts about their voting system. And their electronic voting system is one of the most modern for a developing country. It's been praised by international bodies. And now Bolsonaro is actively trying to destroy trust in the voting system. So, I mean, we saw what happened in the U.S., right? Brazil, um, and, and Brazil is not the U.S. I feel like Brazilian institutions are weaker. Um, it's a more chaotic place. Um, I, there's, I mean, there's definitely going to be violence, in my opinion, today. It's just a question of to what extent, um, and also to what extent that is backed by institutions like the military police, um, the military. I still think it's going to be isolated bouts of violence, but um, as we said, uh, do not predict Brazil. <laughs> right, uh, which, which is what Fernando said. Fernando... Uh uh, before the U.S. election, Donald Trump uh, had talked up the possibility of fraud when he was down in the polls. He lost. He then claimed there was fraud. Uh, this idea that uh, Jair Bolsonaro is floating that we need paper ballots as well as electronic voting, what do you make of it? Well, I don't think it's, uh, it's a good point for him to make because I agree with uh, has what have been said that Brazil's uh, uh, electronic vote system is very strong. Uh, still, when I say Brazil institutions are strong, that means that they resist to attacks from coming from any, any side. It's not the first side, first time a president go against the Supreme Court, which has a very different, well, way of being in Brazil than in all the other countries. Uh, the Supreme Court in Brazil is, is a major political actor almost is being filmed, the judges and are filmed every day in, with while giving their decisions and everything, uh, which is very odd. But uh, on the um, ballots, electronic ballots, I think they are a safe way and they, are, they have been tested and I don't think there's uh, a deal on that matter. We talked about uh, how uh, it's not just corruption allegations flying, it's how you manage the country. We talked about COVID. Uh, there's an indicator that uh, could worry Jair Bolsonaro a lot, and that's inflation, the rate hitting nearly 9% in July. It's the 14th straight month of increase. And here you see the graph showing uh, Brazil's uh, growth, and uh, it's predicted to uh, uh, dip just uh, below the flat line uh, for this quarter. Uh, Samantha Pearson, um, Brazil, it's uh, since the heyday uh, when Lula's president, we still haven't seen the kind of booming uh, growth that we saw uh, in the old days. Exactly. So, I mean, Lula did have some luck in that he was president during, you know, one of Brazil's biggest ever commodity booms. Um, but yeah, Brazil is it's that constant story of expectation and hope followed by utter disappointment. Um, and we've seen that a little bit with Bolsonaro on the economic front as well. He won a lot of support in 2018 from the financial markets in Brazil, the banking sector here. And they were important in, in adding legitimacy to his candidacy. Um, and he, Bolsonaro, promised lots of economic reforms, which largely haven't happened. 
And then also the man on the street, the kind of poor families in Brazil, they believed in Bolsonaro as well um, in terms of employment and keeping down inflation. Now, inflation is key because um, if you speak to a lot of Brazilians now, um, you know, poor families, they'll say, my God, the, the cost of beans has gone up so much, the cost of rice has gone up so much, and they blame Bolsonaro for that. Um, so on, on one side, that's happening with poor Brazilians, but also you speak to people in the banking sector now, they're just, they're fed up with Bolsonaro. Um, they call him an idiot. <laughs> um, it's his chaotic style as well. It's not just what he does or what he doesn't do. It's the fact that he, you know, comes out with all guns blaring, making some ridiculous remark that makes, the, you know, makes the headlines, um, which is not great for investors who like boring presidents and, and predictability. Um, so they're even behind closed doors saying, you know, if Lula comes back as president, so be it. I, we can deal with that. At least it's going to be a constant um, government. We know what Lula's like. Um, so, yeah, he's losing support on the economic front on both so too, sides. Too erratic. Right? Why is inflation mm -hmm. rising? Um, I mean, if, uh, inflation is rising because of the exchange rate, um, but also because the exchange rate means that um, Brazil's real uh, got particularly weak against the dollar, which meant that Brazilians were exporting a lot of um, uh, commodities, which then caused a um, shortage in the domestic market. Um, so there's a lot of factors. I mean... A lot of that is not also to do with, um, it's not Bolsonaro's fault necessarily. Um, the pandemic played a big role in that as well. But um, that's, that doesn't matter, you know, <laughs> to the average Brazilian on the street. He sees the price of beans go up during Bolsonaro's government and it's Bolsonaro's fault. We've talked about parallels with the United States, uh, Marcia Camargos, uh, and what it was like under Trump and what it's still like with the so-called culture wars that exist there and the polarization. Uh, there's one uh, hot button issue right now that we haven't broached so far, and that is the case that's pending before the Supreme Court regarding indigenous people. We've heard strong language from Jair Bolsonaro. We're expecting some kind of big ruling uh, regarding whether or not they have the right to get back land that was seized decades ago. Your thoughts on what will happen when the Supreme Court rules? Well, um, when the Supreme Court uh, rules and he is obliged to step off uh, office, uh, things will change a lot because uh, they were saying about uh, but inflation. But on, on the specific instance of indigenous people, who, by the way, rallied this Independence Day for their rights. You are asking if things will change, yes? No, how will they change once the Supreme Court is ruled? Will it be even more polarized? Yes, they're, they're real, because uh, Bolsonaro, he just, uh, we're talking about corruption and inflation, but he just destroyed the country. You uh, said about uh, corruption uh, during Lula's uh, government, but he took millions of people out of extreme poverty. He improved social programs very strongly, and that's why he was the, the middle class, part of the middle class wasn't happy with Lula. And uh, things are getting worse and worse with Bolsonaro, and he's a real threat uh, for democracy. Uh, this land rights issue, Fernando Santiago, how much will it play in the build-up to elections next year? Well, I'm not so sure that it will uh, have a capital importance on that. Uh, mostly, it will be, well, can be used by the opposition in order to... Uh, uh, well, to go against or or in benefit of Bolsonaro, it depends on the results, of course. But the thing is, the Indians, despite the historical heritage that they have in Brazil, they are not very quantitatively representative on a mount. They cannot change the the, 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 the destination or, or the the end of an election. So there's going to be just a case for it to play around the pros or, or, or cons. Samantha Pearson, you agree? Sorry, could you just repeat that? It, it cut out very quickly. I said, do you agree that uh, uh, the, this issue of the land rights for indigenous people, it won't be that big an issue next year? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's it's unclear what's um, what's going to happen there. I mean, they've been um, holding protests in Brasilia uh, recently. There was some concern over even what's going to happen today, if they're going to be a target. So um, it's not quite clear yet. So uh, we've we've talked about how uh, Brazil's president uh, 
uh, has played ag again uh, to his to his base throughout his tenure since 2018. How he's cried foul. Uh, and now, as we head into uh, election period, and our correspondent earlier was saying how uh, this, in fact, uh, is in a way this Independence Day the kickoff uh, of the campaign. Who is going to play kingmaker, Samantha? <laughs> Good question. Good question. I mean, hopefully it's going to be the voter, you know, I mean, that would be ideal, right? We had an election where the voter could choose the outcome. Um, but in Brazil, things always get messy and it's going to get even messier next year. I mean, Bolsonaro could win. I suppose he could actually win an outright um, victory uh, next year and that would make things simpler. But it doesn't look that way. The polls are suggesting that Lula would probably beat him in a runoff vote. Um, and then I imagine then exactly what's going to happen then, right? That's the big question. Um, so probably, and this is and this is me trying to second guess Brazil, which I've just said is not a good thing to do. But probably what we're going to see is violence. At least we're going to see um, bouts of violence. Now, Bolsonaro has quite a lot of support with the military police, um, with less senior people within the military, and that is a big question mark right now. We just don't know what they would do in that situation because if you if you think about it, they. He's going to be losing um, against Lula, you know, who a lot of people, uh, uh, including lawyers, would say who actually deserves to be in jail right now. So, I mean, the legal um, the legal grounds for that is pretty murky. Um, I, it would fall to the, the electoral court and then the Supreme Court. Um, but it all really, I mean, as, as any democracy, it depends on what the military does in Brazil and the military police. What the military does, what the military police does, uh, Fernando Santiago, you heard uh, Marcia uh, Camargo's uh, worry aloud about uh, militia groups uh, that uh, uh, support the, uh, the president. Uh, could there be much violence in the year to come? Well, uh, I agree that we are in a situation very uh, complicated because uh, the country, it is very polarized. And indeed, Lula, well, he's ahead on the uh, researches right now, and uh, he, he has a many and very, very many uh, procedures, criminal procedures against him. I, I remember you, Lula was never acquainted, he was never declared innocent. What they did is recognize that Judge Moro didn't have jurisdiction to judge his case, but the decisions Moro take Technically, they were validated once by a superior court, but composed by three judges, and again by another superior court composed by 11 judges, which means that technically there's some fundamental uh, thing that must be good, must be solid. If not, one of the judges could disagree, and not even one of them did disagree. So uh, if you get into a situation in which we have Bolsonaro from one, uh, one side and Lula from the other side, which many people uh, don't want in power because they see him as a criminal, indeed, I, I agree that could have a lot of tension. I, I, I'm not able <laughs> right now to say uh, what could go on, but some crisis, of course, a crisis could uh, go over. All right. It's only the beginning so far of the, uh, again, of the buildup to those elections in October of 2022. I want to thank you so much, uh, Fernando Santiago, for joining us uh, from Lisbon, Marcia Camargos, Samantha Pearson in Sao Paulo. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.